around. So, so I just had to, you know, I just had to say that when you see those guys in that picture, they're um, they're part of a process which was not far more deeply involved in European politics, had far greater knowledge of what was going on outside their region than we would generally imagine would happen in the middle of the 17th century. And I'm hoping to bring that word to people of European history and let them know that there's a dimension of the Thirty Years' War that does extend to West Central Africa and that it was an active participation on the part of an African kingdom. Okay, so now I've got that off my chest. Okay, so also very interested, um, to be honest with you, um, with those, uh, that, that wonderful story of those Kutu and um, the Order of Christ and all the other um, related paraphernalia that the, um, the Kingdom of Congo, as, as Cecile puts it very nicely, um, it's not probably enough to talk about this integration of culture and whatever as appropriation or as borrowing or as emulation. Um, although I will say that the kings of Congo were extremely anxious to be regarded as a part of Christendom. When Antonio Manuel, whose image you saw there, um, went to Europe in 1604, um, also a person who was competent in Latin, um, I should mention as well, he left, when he died, he left a bundle of 70 documents that he had in his possession when he died including nine or ten documents that were issued by the Chancellery of the Kingdom of Congo um, while he was serving in various governmental positions within the kingdom itself. Um, and one of my favorites of those is uh, a letter of appointment given to him, making him the secretary of the Mwene um, Pemba and granting him a salary of five Lufukusa Zimbu shells a month. This is specified in the letter. However, he had to pay one and a half of the food symbols for the right to have this position. And the document was sealed um, with a presumably wax seal, the greasy scar of which was remained on the bottom of the text. I'm looking at this record and realizing that this was something issued by the Congo Chancellery to one of its subjects for a sort of a mundane appointment task. And he had several other messages and letters like that. Um, reminded me that this was a country that had, in fact, governed its internal affairs by means of written documentation that issued by chancellor. Um, and clearly the language of these documents suggests that these were mundane documents routinely issued, even though we have uh, but a handful of them in our possession. Um, I don't know if one can talk about that as being appropriation of writing, or emulation of writing, or whether the fact that so many Congolese who came, educated Congolese who came Europe or to Brazil were educated entirely within their own country, so the, the level of sophistication. And, and I must say, if you look at the correspondence that Antonio Manuel had while he was living in Europe, this is a man who was very much at home in European culture. Um, and presumably, as you look at his image, wearing one of those uh, uh, nets, uh, very much at home in his own country, uh, I think you can, you can appreciate it significance of that interaction between the two, the two regions and how much the Congolese were really much, very much in charge of what they were doing throughout this period of time. I mean, you don't know, hear about the Portuguese colony of Angola, their bitter enemies, uh, the wars between the two. Uh, Congo was never defeated on its own territory by a Portuguese army. Uh, and the tragedy, from my point of view, that that same country ate itself alive with civil wars and exported thousands and thousands and thousands of its subjects abroad. Um, Linda wrote a, a, a brilliant article, in my opinion, of course, I can't really say too much about Linda, um, showing how gradually uh, everything in the kingdom became, uh, every political offense became a ground for exporting the subjects of dissident rebels. Congo didn't suffer from incursions from outside its boundaries ate itself alive. Um, and all we can say to that is that it did indeed spread its culture very widely uh, in the Americas. And in 40 seconds, I won't go into the second part of all my work on the Kingdom of Congo, which is to take a look at how significant it's been in the development of cultural transformations uh, in the Americas as well. Thank you. Thank you for the 
those papers both they fit together very nicely, uh, visually and thematically. Um, I want to ask Cecile, you, you said that those ambassadors went to Brazil in order to get regalia that they were going to bring. Do you have any evidence that they succeeded in that quest or anything further? I just just a small detail that I thought was fascinating. Yeah, uh, there's actually um, uh, I, I think. There's actually a further uh, painting of the same uh, group of men uh, portraits when they were back in, um, they went to uh, Holland afterwards, the little countries. And one of the paintings showed them with some of the regalia that they acquired there. Um, so a, a surge in particular that they got from the UN office. Uh, and we know it's a surge because uh, we have a description from a letter. So yeah, they were successful and they continued. Um, that could be something you could continue, I guess, to follow. Maybe in your work. Yeah, then what happened with the cert exactly? I'm not sure, but um, yeah, we'll find it. Right? <laughs> well, like Vicky, I love textiles and regalia. Um, you mentioned something about um, evidence in one of the noble graves that there were textiles. Um, and I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that because I would think they had deteriorated quite extensively. So what is the evidence and is there a hope that any other evidence of textiles might be found in the graves that you're discovering now in your, in your work? Yes, we have, uh, we found some textile, uh, just a little bit preserved ne next to the skull. Uh, we believe it may have been one of the layer of the wrapping of the, of the body. Uh, it was probably preserved thanks to uh, copper oxide mm -hmm. uh, who, who uh, imprinted it. That being said, I think this grave is probably 19th century, so it's less exciting uh, than if it would be earlier. Uh, while I have the, the mic, uh, the floor, I would like to ask uh, both John and Cecile a question about the poo, uh, because in one of the slides you show, uh, there is a red feather on top of the poo. And you also see the same red feather on top of the Mpu worn by the Ndongo king, if you look carefully. So there is definitely a tradition of a little row, small red feather on top of the Mpu. Is there any description or any analysis or do you say anything more about it? Because of course, those kind of small red feather are quite widespread, as far as I know, in Bantu area. You have also pictures of the, the Nimi, the Kuba king, uh, with the same thing in his mouth. And on, in the grassland, the smell, the same kind of red feather is also extremely widespread as a regalia. Or I don't like too much the use of regalia. Regalia really related to the kings, not a symbol of power, uh, or elite symbol. But uh, I was wondering if there is any uh, historical evidence about those red feathers in Congo and asking everybody because I would be I would be interested. Right. I mean, the, the documents do mention feathers in particular and, and that has to do with this, you know, adding those particular emblems that add to the particular origins of the power of the wearer of the um, uh, the documents talk about the feathers specifically. Do they talk about red feathers? I'm not sure. It's one of these questions that once you have identified you have to go back to the text and read it through with that lens. Uh, I, I haven't paid attention to no, I, I'm going to go back to the test myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'd like to know a bit more about the uh, expansion of Kihongo into the north across the river. Um, you suggest that it, uh, you show on your diagram of, of linguistic expansion. It shows the expansion of Kihongo much farther than political uh, control, I think, and, and so that much of that northern region, Kilari and so on, extends into Tege uh, country. So uh, you alluded to the copper, um, the role of copper and the interest in copper. Um, so I'd like to have hear a little bit more about this this expansion of of. Kikongo or Congo influence into the other neighboring neighboring regions. If you have something to say about that, yeah. what, what we see from our linguistic data is that the 
yeah, the language is spoken in Congo, Southern Congo, Brazzaville, so like Kilari, Kidondo, Kihangala, this, nor, actually north of the Congo River, if we, apart from Kimanyanga, that they, they are actually quite distinct subgroup from what is spoken in the rest of the, the Congo uh, group and the Congo dialect continuum, and often they stand out as, as different. They do not participate in innovations that, uh, like they don't have gangula, they don't uh, syncopate prefix, uh, prefixes, they, they uh, like for, we also did work on their dance and aspect system, how time is expressed in these languages, they have different markers, so they are really, they are different, and it's, it's true they are known as, but we didn't really do research on that for their um, uh, contact with Teke, Teke languages, but Within, they are part of this bigger unit uh, of what we call it Kikongo because it, it was called like that by, by Guthrie. It's the H10 group in Guthrie's classification. But if you look at the internal cohesion within the Congo group, they stand out as, as uh, separate and, and they do not participate in a lot of things which were, which are present in other Kikongo uh, varieties. On, on the other hand, from uh, an archaeological point of view, the pottery uh, is, is very fine woven uh, with a very specific temper as well. Uh, we found exactly the same in the copper or area that we are finding across the river in uh, around Banzansudi and Bazagungu and all those places. So there you, you really feel that you're part of the same kind of uh, material culture, uh, at least for the 14th uh, century, uh, if not earlier, uh, in any case. Right. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, river, uh, if, you, if you look at the map of the distribution of the different kind of uh, the central area, the, the, the contact area in the center, uh, go on both sides of the river, uh, of the Congo River, and it's an area where the river is very easy to cross uh, and also to navigate. You are in between two uh, series of uh, white water rapids. Uh, so there, I believe the river was more linked and facilitated contact rather to, to be the, the barrier at this further down after, uh, after Matadi or further upstream between uh, kind of Luozi up all the way to, to Kinshasa where you have a lot of stream as you, you know, and white water. One second. Well, mine is very, very short. It's just a pitch um, that one of the, the narrators interviewed in the 1930s was uh, in South Carolina, enslaved. He was a very powerful preacher. When he got married, his wife said, he went down under the water with me. Um, that was the description of the marriage. And for this, he wore a red flat feather. Thank you to all of our panelists.